Well, hey everybody, it's great to see you today. This is Living Power, your online Bible study. We are walking through the Bible in a year. We are in 2 Samuel, and today is April 24th, and we are studying about the life of David, and today is a great day to be tuning in because we're going to be doing two things. Today we're going to talk about the Davidic covenant. We've talked about the covenant with Noah. We've talked about the covenant with Abraham. Today we're going to talk about the covenant with David, and this is huge for us as Christians. Second thing we're going to talk about is the expansion of the kingdom, and we're going to see how David expands Israel and um, kind of where that takes him. And so that's what we're going to cover today. Um, we have a lesson today entitled An Everlasting Dynasty, and that is a good way to summarize the covenant that the Lord made with David. And we see David has an idea. He wants to do something for the Lord. He feels maybe a little bit guilty. He's living in a palace. And he looks out and he sees that the ark is simply in a tent. And he says, this, is, this will never do. We must build a temple, a glorious temple for the Lord. And he's thinking about this. And um, he calls in Nathan, the prophet. And seems right to Nathan. He says, go ahead and do whatever the Lord, um, whatever you think the Lord is telling you to do. Well, that night the Lord appears to Nathan in a dream and says to him, go and tell David these things. And basically, God is making a promise to David. He is saying no in one sense, and in another sense, he is saying yes, yes. What he's saying no about is that David won't be the one to actually build the temple. Great that David had the idea, but he's not going to be able to be the one to build it. His son, Solomon, is actually the one later that ends up building it, but I'm getting ahead of the reading today. David cannot build the temple, but... What God says is, to me, one of the sweetest scriptures in the whole, whole Bible. One of the sweetest passages we will look at this whole year, and we get to cover it today. I love it. It's in 2 Samuel 7, verse 11. And I'll paraphrase for you. It's where God says, you won't make a house for me. I will make a house for you. And that, to me, is so sweet because it captures the essence of God's heart. God loves to bless. He is a giver at heart. And you just can't outgive God. You just can't do it. And here what he's saying is, I don't want you to miss this because it's real important to understand the Davidic covenant. What he's saying is, no, David, you won't be the one to build me the temple, but I will make a house, a dynasty for you. So let's look at this. Four things are in God's promise to David. First of all, God's going to make David's name famous. Second of all, he's going to provide a homeland for Israel, which is Israel, the, the nation of Israel today. Three, God's going to give David rest from his enemies. Huge, hugely important. Don't we all want peace? And fourth, he's going to secure a dynasty for him forever. And um, in verse 12, it says, I will raise up God, I will raise up a descendant and make his kingdom strong. Of course, that descendant that he's talking about is Jesus Christ himself, who is a descendant of David. Okay, and then it says he will build a temple. Do you remember when Jesus was on earth and he said, I can destroy and raise up this temple in three days? And everyone was like, how can you do that in three days? It took us years to build this. Well, he wasn't talking about the physical. He was talking about the spiritual, wasn't he? And then in verse 12, it also says, I will be his father, God. I will be his father, this descendant that is to come. And he will be my son. Remember when God said to Jesus in Matthew 3, 17, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. This scripture in verse 12 was referring to Jesus Christ. And then in verse 12, the last thing, it says, his kingdom will continue before me forever and your throne will be secured forever. Now, if a descendant of David sits on the throne and stays on the throne, then 
David has a dynasty that lasts forever. This is what God was referring to, that he was going to put Jesus Christ on the throne. He is the king of kings, and he is king of Israel, and someday he will be recognized as such. Now, if you read Luke 1, verse 32 and 33, when the angel came to Mary, I'm sure you probably know this story already, but have you ever read the story of the angel coming to Mary with this passage today where God is giving him a covenant, God is giving David a covenant, have you put the two together? Listen to how they fit, kitten glove. In the covenant, verse 12, it says his content, kingdom will continue before me forever and your throne will be secured forever. Now let's say you were Mary and you had heard the stories and you knew that scripture very, very well. And it's quite possible, I believe that she did know because there was so much expectation at the time of Jesus' birth that the Messiah could come at any time that I believe it was very commonplace to be expecting him. So Luke 1 verse 32 and 33 says, He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. So here's that promise that he's going to be the, called the Son of God. God will give him the throne of David and he will reign over Israel forever. So if you were Mary and you knew the Davidic covenant and you knew the promise and you had been waiting like the people in Israel for hundreds of years, but you were in expectation and someone said though, or that angel said those specific words to you, it's quite possible that you would put two and two together and be able to say, this is the descendant that has been proclaimed for so long. Praise be to the Lord. May it be as you have said which is how Mary replied. This is the source of the Messianic hope, which we'll be reading about for months and months, and I will make sure that I point out the, the places in the scripture where it talks about the Messiah coming. Don't you just love that? The Davidic covenant is wonderful. It's something so important to understand because this is a covenant that we can understand for us. I mean, we're waiting for the King of Kings to be put on the throne too. And we will live um, in his kingdom someday. Now, the other thing we said we would talk about today was the expansion of the kingdom. And I don't have a lot. I just have uh, a little bit to tell you. But this is really important. 2 Samuel 8, verse 14. You might want to underline this in, in your Bible. It says, The Lord <clears throat> gave David success wherever he went. And, oh, if this scripture passage could be true of all of us. Wouldn't you just love the Lord to give you success wherever you go? You know, we can pray scripture, and we can pray that scripture over our own lives. And it certainly is a good one. Um, we need to be careful, though, if we choose to pray that scripture, not to try to use God to conform to our wishes, but that He would, we would allow Him to mold our heart to always be able to follow Him wherever He's leading us. So it's, um, that's a little bit different perspective, isn't it? But the Lord gave David success everywhere he went. He conquers four nations. He conquers the Philistines in the west. So picture Israel in your mind. In, to the west of them, the Philistines have lived. They have been an enemy to Israel for over a hundred years. No longer David squelches the threat. <clears throat> They're a threat to Israel no longer. Moab is in the east. He makes them a vassal state. He conquers them. Edom is in the south. They ended up paying tribute to Israel. And kings love it when other, other places pay tribute because that's like taxes. And then Damascus in the north, the Armenians, when their king was off fighting in the Euphrates River area, Israel went in and was able to capture that land. They were able to bring home gold shields, bronze artifacts, chariot horses, this is the first time I'm seeing this. You two, chariot horses, army prisoners, 7,000 charioteers, and 20,000 foot soldiers. So they're taking some of the plunder, they're adding it to the armory, and they're just becoming a very, very strong nation. Very strong nation. The proper response to success from this passage, uh, I think this is the application for us today from the reading. Humility. Praising the Lord 
and giving the spoils to him. Notice how David always gives some of the spoils away. He doesn't keep it all for himself. He always gives some of the spoils away, and I think that's so true. Are we tithing? Are we giving? Are we asking God to cultivate in us a generous spirit so that we can give to others in need? Um, I want to mention one more thing because we have just a minute. We're reading parts of Samuel and parts of First Chronicles. And if, if you didn't know, I wanted to kind of explain why that is. A lot of the stories are repeated, you know, in 2 Samuel and Chronicles. However, some details are added in, in some books and not others. And it's important to read them both at the same time. Samuel is more from a political viewpoint, and Chronicles is more from a theocratic or a theological viewpoint. We see more of God's side of things, um, than we do in Samuel. So that's why we're reading these two books at the same time. I just wanted to clarify that with you. Well, we are um, in the book of 2 Samuel. We're going to continue with the life of David. It gets filled with intrigue and uh, deception over the next couple of days. So um, continue in your reading, and um, I can't wait to see you again tomorrow. Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you in Bible study with you today. Shalom.